Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sean Yo, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, <clears throat> one moment here, sorry, just lost my spot already. <laughs> For an optimal experience, we uh, recommend that you keep Zoom in speaker view uh, for tonight's uh, presentation. Also note, this town hall is being recorded. We'd really like to thank you for joining the Green Party of Ontario's fifth platform town hall, Reimagining Education in Child Care. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, share a land acknowledgement. As we open the space in our time together tonight, I invite you to join me in acknowledging that we meet on the traditional territory in unceded Indigenous lands here and across Ontario. For me, it's very important that land acknowledgements uh, aren't uh, a script or a box to be checked, a video to be played, but something that's living and breathing and part of the journey along reconciliation. And that's why today uh, I'd like to extend this also to be something of an Indigenous lives acknowledgement. Uh, as I'm sure you uh, have heard, uh, in the Cam Loops Indian Residential School, uh, they recently tragically found uh, uh, the bodies of 215 uh, stolen children in a mass unmarked grave. Uh, it is uh, so heart-wrenchingly awful uh, to uh, think about, uh, and we urgently must do better and be better uh, with our uh, reconciliation so that there can be greater equity and dignity for everyone who lives on these lands. I'd like to uh, read a little something here uh, to share a different voice. Uh, so from uh, the Tukumlubs Tukswapam uh, is the home community of uh, the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And I'm gonna read a little something from their May 17th press release that they provided, uh, which uh, made this uh, announcement of this atrocity. This was the largest school in the Indian Affairs Residential School system. As such, Tukumlubs Tukswapam uh, leadership acknowledges their responsibility to caretake for these lost children. Quote, we had a knowing in our community that we were able to verify. To our knowledge, these missing children are undocumented deaths, stated Chief Roseanne Casimir, some as young as three years old. We sought out a way to confirm that knowing out of deepest respect and love for these lost children and their families, understanding that Tacoma to Squapum is the final resting place for these children. This would be an important time, if difficult time, to remember that there are 4,100 missing children who have been identified as part of the Indigenous Missing Children's Project. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I'll, I'll be adding links to the press release uh, to the Missing Children's Project uh, and a, a short background on the Kamloops Indian Residential School. It's uh, especially hard that this news comes at the time that we're talking about childcare and education and creating opportunity and better lives uh, for the next generation. Um, so to get us back uh, to this event for tonight, we're here to understand your concerns about childcare and education and getting your feedback to help us inform the GPO platform. We have a really great panel this evening. We have a Q&A session later where we'll take questions from you. So the overview of the town hall and house rules, I just wanna give everyone a, a, a level set here. And that is we ask everyone to remain on mute and only unmute when you're speaking or called upon. And for those purposes, we'd really appreciate it if you had your correct name displayed. We'll be using the polling feature to help guide our discussion. So when prompted, please complete the poll if that's something you'd like to participate in. We'll be using the raise hand function when Mike asks the audience a question. You can find the raise hand function under reactions. During, oh, sorry, those who call into the town hall won't have uh, access to all of these features. Uh, unfortunately, we will do our best to include you as time allows. When we have the audience uh, portion, you'll be able to type in your questions in chat, and our team will help make sure we get a variety of questions to our panel. I wanna take some time uh, to make sure that everyone understands and hears that today's town hall is a safer space for all guests, speakers, and participants. Our equity officer is online with us today, Ran. Actually, I don't see Ran. Well, I'll get an update on that in a minute. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, that means that we have somebody here who can address any concerns you have uh, in terms of equity during this meeting. We have zero tolerance for hate, abusive or discriminatory language or harassment. We ask that everyone participate with respect for one another in the spirit and the community as we come together to focus our conversation and time tonight on the topic of reimagining childcare and education in Ontario. Okay, so before I pass things off, let's kick things off with our first poll, which will also give us a little bit of practice uh, for later on. So our first poll question is, what are the top three issues that concern you when you think about childcare in your community? So I'm gonna take a moment to fill this out and I hope you do too. That was hard. I really wanted to do more than three, <laughs> but if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you everyone for participating in the poll. And right now I'm gonna turn things over to Mike Schreiner, leader of the Green Party of Ontario, who's gonna introduce our special guests and discuss their reaction to our first poll. Well, thank you, Sean, and thanks everyone for joining us. And Sean, I just wanted to thank you for your opening words and, and say to everyone, if you have not had the opportunity, I strongly encourage uh, folks to watch the speech that MPP Saul Mamakwa, who's an NDP member of the legislature from Quentin, uh gave Monday morning right before uh, question period, uh, just addressing the crimes against humanity that Indigenous children have experienced in the residential school system and his calls to action, which I thought were very emotional and very powerful. Um, I also just want to say how much I greatly appreciate everyone who's joining us tonight to be part of this important conversation. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our special guest in a second, but I just want to say that I think hearing your voices and hearing the voices of experts at the same time, the intersection of people in communities and experts uh, with expertise and experience in tonight's case, uh, childcare and education. I think the intersection of those voices is really important in guiding the Green Party's platform development as we seek to build a greener and more caring Ontario. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion tonight uh, I want to introduce our first special guest, Elaine Levy, who is the Vice President of Child Care and Family Services at Wood Green Community Services. Elaine was um, appointed as Director of Child Care Services at Wood Green in 1982. And I've been very impressed with the work that Wood Green has done over the years. And in particular, the work that Elaine did in building their child care services from two to seven facilities and the work she's done with the Bruce uh, Wood Green Early Learning Center, which integrates uh, kindergarten, child care, and parental support, and really played a sort of foundational and important role in Dr. Charles Pascal's uh, 2009 report that led to the implementation of full day kindergarten in Ontario. So Elaine, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I, I want to introduce Matt, and then I'm going to ask you, Elaine, to respond to the, the poll results. So also joining us tonight is, is Matt Richter, who is the Green Party of Ontario's uh, shadow cabinet uh, critic for education. And Matt is also the nominated candidate for the Green Party in Perry Sound, Muskoka. Matt has been a longtime educator and active within his local school. System and you, he's all been a parent, but he buys business and a teacher and also being a parent and had, had um, the second highest vote total of all Green Party candidates um, behind this one guy uh, in the last provincial election. But he did better than that guy in the previous provincial election. So I got to give Matt a big shout out 
and welcome both of you to tonight's uh, town hall event. And so, Elaine, I, I'm wondering if you want to uh, give your first impression of the poll results. Sure, thank you. Um, and good evening, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this very important discussion. Um, the poll results do not surprise me. Um, we have long uh, throughout the sector cited affordability, accessibility, and quality as the three main areas where we really need to focus. Um, so I'm you know, as I said, I'm not surprised to see that those are that those are the results. Um, and during the conversation tonight, I'm sure that we'll touch on many of those things, especially in light of the um, the new federal money that's been announced and what we are what we have been dealing with during COVID and what we believe we'll be dealing with once we come out of COVID, which hopefully will be soon. Or um, Thank you, Elaine. And, and Matt, do you want to do you want to give your first reaction to the poll results? Yeah, uh, certainly. And welcome, everyone. Uh, like, like Elaine, not any surprises. But as Sean also said, they it was very hard to select three. That being said, in my personal experience through teaching and even in the rural communities of our riding and throughout Ontario, I I picked up on the third one, which was flexible hours at thirty nine percent, I believe. And we, like so many ridings in Ontario, have a massive amount of workforce that works seasonal hours. And those hours fluctuate, especially in the, the peak construction and road construction seasons of spring through fall. And we, we often hear that as being, from many, their number one concern is the lack of flexible daycare hours. Yeah, I'm just going to briefly uh, respond and then start asking some questions. And and I agree. I think I thought Elaine really nailed it with affordability, accessibility, and quality. And I remember when our um, I have two daughters, and when our last daughter finished um, her childcare years, um, suddenly uh, my family felt wealthy all of a sudden because we had spent so much money on childcare for so long. And, uh, and what, a, what a financial relief it was for us. And, and I know so many families um, struggle to afford high quality accessible childcare. And, and I can relate at times to flexible hours because I ran my own business. And I can tell you there were a number of days where I was right up against six o'clock and stressed out about getting there in time uh, for pickup. Uh, so, so, I, so I hear you. And, um, so I want to, before we open things up to the audience, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask a couple questions myself. And you Elaine, I'd like to, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that Fran Zhu uh, just joined a few moments ago. So our equity oh, officer is here. I put a, a reminder on how to contact him in chat, but I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. I was looking for a time to just sneak in there. So thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sean. Thank you. So I'm going to direct the first question to, to you, Elaine. And and, and it's somewhat COVID related in the sense that, um, you know, the last 15 months, you know, obviously has been incredibly challenging for people, uh, but it's been especially challenging for women. And there's been a lot of talk about the she session. And we know that the employment decline for women was double that. That's for actually virtual learning and a lot of, you know, trying to work virtually and school children at the same time. And I think it's really highlighted just how vital affordable, accessible, quality childcare is, not only for families and children, but also for our economy and particularly women's participation in the economy. And so I think I certainly welcome the federal government's announcement as I think many Ontarians and many people across Canada uh, have as well, but we know it's going to take the province being an active partner in, in implementing um, a national childcare program within our province. And so as you think about how we can reimagine childcare in Ontario, uh, especially given the federal announcement and what role the provincial government can play in making sure 
that we have the kind of child care system that supports children, families, and especially mothers. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. It's extremely uh, disheartening and troublesome to note how, how much COVID has impacted uh, participation of women in the labor market and how significantly that participation is limited. Um, you're right, a lot of it does have to do with virtual learning, but that is, that's really not the only um, cause of this. You know, there's been impacts on family and employment, there may be parents now working at home, uh, our people had to leave the workforce and that is primarily, um, primarily women. Um, and there's also a lot of concern about health and safety. Families have been very reluctant to come back. Our centers, and I think this is true, much of what I say will be um, reflective of the Toronto experience because that's I know, especially for those of you who might be outside of the GTA. My apologies, um, but this is what I this is what I live every day, so I'm sort of best able to reflect on that. Um, enrollments in centers throughout the GTA have declined by about 50, 54 percent, um, and that's because families are at home, parents are at home, parents have lost their jobs. Uh, parents are having to do virtual school, and a lot of the um, a lot of the roles that that women in particular have filled are in industries that have really grown to a halt. So that's extremely problematic. Um, so there have been all these economic impacts, and there's also been a really significant impact on health and safety uh, for children and for and for their parents. Um, there's a recent history that. And they found that one in three um, parents' caregivers reported really high levels of anxiety, um, and almost 60% reported symptoms that would be described as symptoms of depression. Parents have reported a lot of difficulties with their children who themselves are experiencing really high stress, um, and children's moods have been. Um, impacted. Um, it's really hard for a lot of children to, um, to be on screen, to be away from their friends, to not be able to engage in all kinds of activities. So the impacts of this have been, have, have been on multiple levels. Um, and I don't think there'll be any kind of recovery, particularly not for parents unless there's, there's child care. Um, so, you know, so for me, I think one of the silver linings about COVID is that the importance of childcare has been highlighted even more than it was before. I think before those people who used childcare realized and recognized how important and significant it was for their families. But I think there's a much broader understanding of the impacts of this on the workforce, on the labor market, on the economy. Um, you know, we've been open, we reopened back in July and we stayed there. We've been open. We've provided the best level of care that we can. We pivoted to, um, in terms of what our group sizes look like, how, how clean is done. I mean, it's really on so many levels that we've responded. Um, but, you know, there were problems in the system before COVID. Uh, COVID has really highlighted a lot of those problems and a lot of the inequities. And the silver lining, I think, is that we have an opportunity now to build back better. And that's sort of one of the mantras that, that you keep hearing in the, in the ever optimistic child care sector, that, you know, this does give us an opportunity to build back better. And, and I think that you know, in order to do that, we first of all have to really take stock of where we are at in very real terms. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, I mean, there's there have been inequities in the system. There are pockets. There are hot, what was more recently been referred to as hot spots where um, there is not enough access. There is not enough um, quality programming available. Um, and I think that now that child care has really been recognized as an integral support, um, we can start a different path forward. And I think part of that will be, um, part of that will include really recognizing the value of early childhood educators as professionals who um, 
support children, support families, provide that care, provide the early learning needs. Um, you know, many years ago now, couch was moved from community and social services into the Ministry of Education. And that's a really important recognition. Not only child care support parents who are working and going to school, but that it really is targeted at fostering children's early learning development, um, all of their levels of um, all of their levels of skill and um, create an environment where they can really thrive and grow. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, those are some of the pieces that we, that we really need to build on. Um, and I think in terms of the federal money and certainly what you said about the need for there to be a strong provincial commitment as well to live up to their part of the expectations, but, the federal money will hopefully allow us to really um, deal with issues of affordability, um, really start to address shift worker needs, which several people already commented about, uh, hopefully result in more regulation for childcare, and really support more and better quality of childcare. You know, I go on about this for a, for a really long time, so I think I've been allocated about 10 minutes, so I don't know if I've... Uh, I don't want to totally dominate the airwaves here, but I mean, that's sort of my initial reaction to hey, the question. Uh, Elaine, I'm, I'm just going to let you know that uh, well, quite a bit of that was a little bit garbled for us. Your audio got choppy, but just as you wrapped up, it got clearer again. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're, we're trying to do everything we can on our end. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll step in a little bit sooner next time, just so you know when it's happening. <laughs> but, yeah. I, yeah, but I also wanted to make sure that our audience knows that it's not just you. Uh, we had a couple of people let us know and we had already noticed it as well. So apologies for everyone. We're doing our very best. Thank you, Elaine. I, I was able to hear uh, at least uh, quite a bit of it and I really appreciate your input. Back to you, Mike. <laughs> I mean, so I know things, Sean. Um, I, I I was able to to hear it, even though there was some audio. Elaine, really quick, I just wanted to ask you a quick follow up. Um, when when the province, like hopefully the province is going to partner with the federal government. It's unclear with the current government whether or not that's going to happen, but hopefully, regardless of who forms government, the province will. Are there, um, I guess, foundational principles that you think the province should bring to the table and or the federal government should bring to the table uh, to ensure we have the kind of child care system that really, you know, serve, serves families? Um, so I think that there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, I think quality, of course, is key. Um, and I think, I mean, here in Toronto, there is a quality measure that is uh, administered by the Toronto Children's Services, it's called the Assessment for Quality Improvement, which really looks at so many different aspects of providing quality here. It's a tool that has been validated through ORC at U of T um, as being a really strong measure for assessment. And I think implementing things of that nature are really important. The workforce issues are huge. Um, this is a profession. It's really challenging to recruit and retain high quality staff because the wages are so low. So there has to be a real commitment to, um, to treating this as a profession and ensuring that there is, there is a province-wide uh, salary grid or I mean, there's already there's so much um, there's so much diversity across the province and across the country in terms of wages that having some kind of um, at least provincial if not national standards um, and um, you know having having a sort of federal provincial table similar to what exists now for healthcare would be beneficial to have those kinds of conversations. I mean and really looking, I mean, right now healthcare and teaching are in part of the Ministry of Education, but there's a lot of disconnect between those. It's not, you know, there's not a true partnership there. There's still in many cases is a um, it's a landlord-tenant relationship as opposed to a real partnership. 
Um, and this is one of the things that we really spent a lot of time and energy on way back during the initial uh, development of Bruce Woodgreen program, where we looked at creating a seamless model. And a lot of the reasons why the success of that was that it really was seamless leadership, and there was a lot of give and take and sharing and professional learning. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I mean, I think that there are many platforms on which those kinds of collaborations need to happen. No, I appreciate that, Elaine. And I think I'm gonna bring Sean back in and we're gonna do another poll question on education. And Matt, I'm gonna ask you to be the first one to respond and reflect on the education poll. Okay, just before we jump to the poll, Elaine, that, that was, uh, it, there was a, a little bit of trouble, but sometimes not so bad. Uh, so uh, potentially, if you want to try turning off your camera, if it's a bandwidth issue, that might help. Uh, and we'll let you know. So if it, uh, it, no, so sad to not see your face anymore. Uh, and then the other thing to mention is that we do have cap, a capture. And so uh, in your Zoom controls, if you turn on closed captions, uh, our caption is doing a great job. And that might be something that could help you out as well. Okay, let's move on to our second poll of uh, tonight. And the question is, what are the biggest education concerns that you face in your community? Please pick your top three. So I'm going to fill this out as well. And then we'll uh, listen to uh, Matt Richter uh, to share some of his thoughts on uh, the results. Just so everyone knows, I filled out the poll as well. <laughs> I uh, I need to find out who in our team are writing these amazing polls with so many compelling options. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's killing me. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, at those options. At those at the poll results. And uh, I'm going to hand things over to Matt Richter to uh, talk to us about what he sees here. All right. Th thank you, Sean. I, I was just quickly trying to scan through and, and pick what the top, top ones were. Clearly class size. And if I'm not mistaken, learning supports an in inclusive and accessible learning environment were second and third. Again, to the... To the last poll, every single item on there is va obviously valid and would be very rational to, to pursue to improve. But let's just look at those and consistently throughout Ontario, whether it be through the unions, through parents, through education staff, even students, class size is, is always in my time being education critic has always been one of the most uh, critical issues to address. And unfortunately throughout Ontario um, and different school boards, as much as there's been an attempt to, to clarify this and, and improve upon it, there's always wiggle room. And we know that students learn best with there's an optimal class size. And it's, it's very bizarre logic that other governments, including the current government, have used when they've actually been on record of saying that more students would actually empower them to have better learning skills for the future after school because work environments can be more than 20 or 25 people, which was obviously absurd. But just to bring everybody into the context, currently in Ontario, in terms of class sizes, because this is a really critical one that I'd, I'd like to address, kindergarten, 29 students is the cap, supposedly, but it can go up to 32. Imagine 32 four and five-year-olds in one classroom. But alas, what the government says is, but there's two educators in that room. So now you have 34 human bodies in one room. That just fundamentally comes across as sounding absurd. Uh, grade one to three, they have a hard cap of 23 students. Grade four to eight, they say, they say it's 24 and a half students on average. But I can tell you from my experience, that average rarely works out in the benefit of a class because obviously you can have classes higher and lower. That's an average across the board. 
And we still have, I still have across Ontario, teachers and unions emailing me saying, Matt, I, I have a class with 33 grade seven students. <laughs> you know, so just imagine that. And then high school supposedly again has a, a cap of 22 and a half or 23 students, but again, that can fluctuate. So how do we get around that is why we're here tonight and how, how we can re-envision and fund correctly the, the school system so that we can have hard cap sizes and class sizes. And if this was in place already, and we could adjust and seamlessly adjust, we could have been hitting for now um, that the 15, what, what Mike and other parties were advocating for was the, the class size cap of 15 during the COVID-19 pandemic. But it seems like it's such a rigid system that these are the concerns we were consistently hearing about. Every other, and I, I know I don't have time here, but every other issue on there is obviously just as valid, but because class size, I wanted to address that because that was clearly at the 63% mark there. Thank you, Matt. Elaine, I'm, I'm curious what, what your, your thoughts are in response, and especially from the perspective that you provided earlier about the importance of partnerships between um, schools and childcare providers. Um, so first, if people can let me know if they can actually, or let you know if they can hear me we better. Can now hear that you my camera, well. you can hear me perfectly. Okay, that, that's better, Elaine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. It's the it's the internet age in the COVID world we live in. I guess so. Um, so I just wanted to point out, and and it relates to class size, although how uh, how that has manifested in childcare since we did reopen, and when we did reopen, we had to reduce our cohort size. Um, in each group. So there were there were caps on, so for example, we could only have 10 children in a room, even if a room was licensed for 15 children. Um, and, um, and another of the silver linings is that that really provided the early childhood educators with opportunities to work with smaller groups of children, create much more one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, and and um, and that uh, people were the children were really able to thrive, especially given that their parents aren't even allowed into the buildings. Um, parents have to drop children off at the door after they go through a screening, so parents don't even come into the environments anymore. So that relationship has become ever more important, and certainly the class sizes have been um, certainly there's been benefits to the smaller class sizes. Um, and the other thing that really strikes me um, is the extreme work that's going to have to be done to, um, to deal with the mental health issues that kids are going to be feeling. So as much as it's been, you know, it was on there anyway as something that, that um, is of concern, it's kids are going to need a lot of help getting, getting, um, it's, you know, they've experienced a trauma. I mean, that, that I think is going to require a level of sensitivity and training and understanding um, that uh, that's that everybody's going to have to all of us who are professionals are going to have to step up to meet and those you know I mean you also see it among among the staff among the educators that whatever their current work is looking like um, has required them to call on um skills and strengths and the support of colleagues and and everything else but but i think all of this needs to be reimagined in terms of how we um how we move forward and as i said build back better because these were issues before um there's some kids who've always experienced stress and children that have all different kinds of learning needs um and even for kids that are you know that people might say oh no they're fine they're fine okay, that's great, I'm glad they're fine, but that's probably a smaller number out of the total group that are that are gonna be fine. So the, the smaller class sizes moving forward, I think is gonna be even more important um, when we first get back. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm gonna be very brief in my response because I agree with what both of you said, and only just to say that, you know, right before COVID, one of the biggest issues at Queens Park was um, learning supports for students, especially students with special needs, and in particular, uh, children with autism. And just, you know, are we going to make those investments? 
Are we going to ensure that our our schools are inclusive? And are we going to ensure that students of all abilities have the supports they need? Um, it's going to be a huge issue. Um, is a huge issue and will continue to be a huge issue. So I I'm going to ask a question, and I'm and Sean's going to choose a few folks from the audience because we want to take a moment to hear from all of you. And so my question to everyone is, in the world you want, what does Ontario's education system and or child care system look like for you? Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. So this is a, a really fun part of a town hall. We get to flip things around and uh, uh, have Mike ask everyone, uh, our participants, a question. So if you uh, go to um, reactions, uh, you'll see a raise hand function there. And uh, if you would like to answer Mike's question, you just need to raise your hand uh, and then I can pick uh, from, uh, from those uh, people. And uh, if you want to turn on your camera and unmute, that would be great. I know Fiona knows all this. Uh, she's been a great contributor before. Uh, so thanks for stepping up first there, uh, Fiona. But I wanted to make sure uh, maybe someone who isn't quite the same frequent flyer as you uh, knows, uh, isn't quite the old hand, knows how to raise their hand as well. Anyways, Fiona, take it away. Unmute and uh, let's hear your answer. Okay, you're not calling me an old hand, I hope. No, that's wrong. Oh. <laughs> no. Um, uh, as you can tell from my hair color, uh, I do not at present um, have a child in school. What I have um, is a 36 year old autistic daughter uh, who lives with me and her dad um, and who had generally a pretty good school experience um, at the time, even though autism was kind of a new thing and a lot of people in the neighborhood looked at her like she had three heads and so did we, but we happen to live in a, uh, you know, in a working class neighborhood where people are not judgmental. That was really, really good and saved a lot of problems. However, I, I am concerned with how parents of autistics are managing to cope now. Um, with the um, lack of special ed teachers um, and trained EAs. Um, Samantha was in, a, was in a special class all the way through school, but she was mainstreamed into various classes. She had the opportunity to win, to be the best person in her class sometimes at math and something else. And, and, and a one-on-one -on -one teacher in high school who recognized both her intelligence and also her very intelligent avoidance behaviors really pushed her to work hard so that when she graduated, she got, I think the greatest gift that a teacher can, can give a student, she knows she can learn and she's gone on doing that. So my wish for the education system of the future would be somehow if it were rich enough to recognize diversity of learning styles and be able to support that. And that of course means at the beginning, supporting, supporting the teachers. So, and, and, and recognizing that teaching is, is an art, you know, as well as a science. That was so great, Fiona. Uh, and I, I'm just uh, feel that I should probably uh, disclose that my wife is a spec ed teacher uh, here in Guelph. Uh, so your message really resonates with me. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to our panelists if they have uh, uh, any anything any short responses uh, to what Fiona said. If not, uh, we'll move on to our next uh, the next answer. Fiona, if, um, if I'll jump in quickly here absolutely so important to to fund appropriately um, the school system so that students with special needs students with autism can get the support they need and research consistently shows going back to your point fiona and to everyone out there it's how important it is that students with autism have consistency and that involves having the same ea for a whole year the, the same spec ed department where the programs don't fluctuate from one year to the next and that's what we hear across ontario that students are getting some support that they require, but then it's an EA shift or funding changes, uh, funding is decreased, so there's less EA time. Um, the spec ed department has a new program and, and it's always about this budget. So I think the Green Party of Ontario absolutely can commit to ensuring that there's a consistency of funding there so that people can expect and predict what they're going to have. And then there's less surprises and there's just a more stable learning environment for everyone. 
Thanks, Matt. I think Elaine had a, a short comment to share as well. Thank you. Um, in the child care sector, we have what's called the Every Child Belongs model, where there are um, trained resource teachers who have additional training over and above the uh, early childhood education training, uh, who support children with a wide range of needs, including children who are autistic, children that have different kinds of language delays, physical disabilities and challenges. Um, and that's a really vital piece of the work that we do. Um, you know, early intervention is a wonderful, uh, wonderful way to hopefully uh, position children for more and more success as they grow, which doesn't take away the need for that to be enhanced and continued once they enter school. But I think that that is one of the real benefits of our system is this every child and it, and it basically is about inclusion and diversity and, and as it says that every child belongs. So I just wanted to uh, make sure people were aware of that. Thanks so much, Elaine. Can okay. I add something? Sorry, Sean. It's go. Joe Kreiderman, and I can't get my raised hand symbol oh, to show. Go, go right ahead, Joe. Okay. Uh, I spent the last 20 years working with uh, adults who and youth who have slipped through the cracks for various reasons. Uh, I would really like to see the Green Party work on uh, trying to establish the fact that child assessments at any level or even youth uh, assessments for the average family. And I would like to see that uh, if there was a way that those child assessments could be less expensive so that uh, more uh, learning disabled children. And that's the other thing I wanted to bring up. I wish we could take away the stigma uh, related to uh, learning disabilities. Uh, so many of the adults I've worked with were undiagnosed learning disabilities. Uh, or they had an undiagnosed and it is so very difficult for them. So sorry, but that was just a suggestion for me. I'll, I'll mute again. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate you uh, uh, sharing your voice with us. Mike, give a quick response for Joe there before I take on, uh, before I uh, pass things over to Rebecca. No, go ahead and pass it on to Rebecca. I, I want to hear more All right. folks. Sounds great. Well, then I invite Rebecca to go off mute and uh, turn on her camera, and we'd love to hear uh, your answer to my questions, Rebecca. Well, first of all, it's an absolute honor to meet Elaine over the internet. Um, our daughter, who's now 16, benefited from that program at Bruce. It's our home school, and my son currently attends that school, so thank you, Elaine. Um, I think funding, which was already covered, is absolutely essential. Uh, we had to do a psych assessment for our son, who has a learning disability, and there were 70 families ahead of us for that assessment because there wasn't enough funding, there weren't enough uh, psychologists available to do those tests. Um, we were fortunate to be able to afford to do that, but we shouldn't have to and parents and families shouldn't have to do that. Um, I think the other key element is that we need leadership that is community-based. We need leadership from our parents and our educators and the people working on the ground with children. Um, we currently have a premier and a minister of education who are completely out of touch. They just have no idea what's happening in public schools and what actual families need in this province. And it's a travesty. And as a Green member, I am so proud of our party for uh, hosting this evening. And I hope to see more good leadership going forward. Um, let's make some good changes in the next year. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, hey, Mike, uh, how about you uh, start off with uh, some short responses before we, uh, we're gonna shift to back to the Q&A part uh, so that uh, we can get some questions for the audience in our next section. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely agree that we have to make it a priority to invest more in education and ensure, and in childcare and ensure that we prioritize our children. And I think um, I think one of the most disappointing things that happened this week for me at Queens Park was to hear that um, that schools weren't going to reopen to in person learning because we as a province hadn't made the investments to make sure they're safe. And, and to me that goes back to, to last summer. And it goes back to the conversations we were having earlier about the disproportionate burden the 
COVID has placed on women. And so I hope as we emerge from COVID that the province makes the investments in child care to be a full participant in the uh, National Child Care Program and adheres to a number of the principles that Elaine outlined, and that we make the investments to ensure that we have um, proper class sizes and supports for children with special needs. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, I need to move things along. So now we're going to go to our Q&A portion of tonight's town hall. So we'll get things back to sort of a, the more normal town hall format. So I'm going to ask uh, anyone on the call who has a question to just use the text chat function uh, to post their question there in, in the chat. Uh, and our uh, GPO team will take a look at that and make sure we get a good variety of questions. Uh, we've also received uh, a lot of questions and comments on social media across all of our different social platforms. And uh, while we really wish we could uh, ask all those questions tonight, we'll uh, definitely uh, try to incorporate some of them. And we'll start off with one right now while everyone has a chance to think about the question that they'd like to ask. This first question comes from Michelle Martin. They write, the Ontario curriculum does not provide enough direction or impetus for teachers to address the climate crisis with their students and engage young people in age-appropriate but mandatory climate inquiry and action as part of their coursework. What can the GPO do about this for Mike and Matt and for Elaine? Maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, early childhood education uh, or other pedagogical uh, strategies for engaging uh, uh, kids and, and our uh, youngest uh, with climate change. Uh, Mike? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I've been so inspired by the youth activists and the climate movement. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg, a 16 year old, well, now 18, but uh, as a high school student has probably influenced the conversation on climate, maybe as much or more than anybody in the world. That being said, uh, I think having uh, climate change discussions integrated into the school curriculum and in all parts of the school curriculum, I think is vital. It's the number one challenge we face as a society. And I would all also say that especially um, given the recommendations that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is just the importance of Indigenous education as well. And there's a lot of intersection between Indigenous teachings, Indigenous education, seven generations thinking, and, and climate action. Thanks so much. Sorry. Hey, Matt, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You know, and just to pick up uh, and bring bring a little context too uh, for Michelle and for everyone. Uh, currently in grades seven and ten, uh, at the science level, the climate change is part of the curriculum. Called it's defined as climate change, climate crisis. Um, it, it's obviously discussed. Grades seven eight, it's formally in the geography level. Now outside of that, as Mike said, and what the what the teachers and education staff and what the unions, I'm sure what we can present is a very compelling reason as to the importance of embedding action to climate change, action to, towards the climate crisis. Um, we, we can embed that through all aspects of the subjects. And the, obviously there would have to be funding for PD, for professional development, for, for gaining those ideas and, and working some acceptance because often teachers and education staff feel dumped on. They're like, there was a time where they said, okay, we need everybody in grade three to learn how to swim. So we want all grade three teachers to have that part of your phys ed program. We wanna see more dance and music, which is all great, but it's, there has to be, it has to be an ease and we have to lower the barriers um, th that allow that to happen. But that being said, that's achievable. How we do it and where we get our, our inspiration from and our guidance from, I wanna pick up on what you said, Mike. Uh, my wife, Kaylee, right now is taking a First Nation Métis Inuit course uh, within education. And she was like, Matt, you have to mention this. You have to mention this because in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report are four calls to action in education. And at the very core, at the very core, of our First Nation, Métis, Inuit communities throughout Canada is the solutions to our climate crisis. And it's just a matter of opening what already exists. 
And, um, you know, we, we don't have time tonight, but but what an amazing, what an amazing collaboration that would be by bringing our school systems together, lined, aligned with all communities and with this document that already exists, which shows us how we can take the solutions, the required solutions to get out of this climate crisis are there, they're laid out if we follow the guidance of our First Nation Métis Inuit. And, and how that could look, I think would be a very ambitious, but exciting and doable, um, doable way forward where we can not only honor our First Nation and Métis and Inuit communities, but we can obviously get real action and uh, a, a realistic approach to this and, and making that happen immediately rather than having to go through a consultation process again because it's been done. Thanks so much, Matt. I'm just going to remind uh, people this question was about uh, the Ontario education curriculum uh, and uh, uh, how much uh, we're able to connect that with uh, climate change. Uh, so, Elaine, uh, the, the question was certainly what the Green Party of Ontario can do about it. Uh, we certainly wouldn't expect you to answer that, but uh, did you want to um, uh, share or reflect on uh, this uh, this topic of uh, climate change in education? Sure. Um, so, again, I'm all about the silver linings today. and. I think one of the other silver linings is that this is the the COVID situation is actually getting kids outside more um, because there there's things that they're able to do outside um, that they're not able to do inside in terms of you know the the kinds of activities that they're engaged in. So I think that's actually a real positive piece, and I would hope that part of what happens in the curriculum um, is that kids are spending more time outside and learning outside and doing all kinds of um, all kinds of curriculum pieces that can be tied to that. Um, there's, I think there are some initiatives that are going on. I know through the TDSB, there's, um, there's what they call eco schools and they share a lot of information about things that people can do. We're part, we're part, we partner with them on that project. So we get regular um, ideas and curriculum ideas that we can be using in our classes. Um, we also had the opportunity to work with the Suzuki Foundation on doing these wonderful, creating these wonderful butterfly gardens. And, you know, I think, I think, again, you know, we, we get, this is another one of the values of early learning, right? Start them young and, and, with those understandings and as Matt was saying sort of the understanding of what the land is all about and what it means and how you can you know how how it's a piece of us and and um just start to build from there and get them get them right the minute they're in the door get them in the door first but thanks so start, much start young Thanks so much. So uh, our next question comes from James Mihaichuk, uh, and he asks, what are the prospects to boost availability of psychologists in schools? I was appalled to learn that local high schools in Ottawa typically have a psychologist on site for half a day per week. We will need a lot more in the wake of the pandemic. So I'm going to uh, hand things over to start uh, with Matt Richter. Uh, thanks, James. And, and I would say whether it be psychologists or any special, uh, anybody with the special training and expertise that we, we need to, we, we need an action plan. And I don't think right now we can come up with a, a straightforward answer as to how many and how often. And I think that's what's so special about these evenings is that we raise the issues and then we need to come together and say, well, what's practical? What's what, what can be done and what are school boards willing to do? Um, a psychologist, to your point, half a day, and I missed this, James, and I know it's written in, but I, it sounded, uh, Sean, that James was saying half a day per week, a psychologist yeah. in each school? Uh, uh, that's what, it, yep. Yeah, so that, go, going Local back to- High schools in Ottawa. Okay, well, going back to an earlier question, um, uh, it just showing how difficult it is to get any assessment or any support in other re regards. Um, that, that's a pretty specific tar target, um, but again, I don't want to fixate on that, but just knowing that, yeah, absolutely, we have to put all supports in there so that students can come out of this and realize that, that they're going to have the access to the mental health services they need. But in terms of funding, the other aspects which sometimes lead to this, um, a lot of students, if they had that central auditory processing assessment done at an early age, they may have had some of their learning difficulties identified earlier, which would prevent 
uh, anxiety, which would prevent depression, which would prevent a variety of, of learning challenges. And, and I just use that as an example because I know it came up earlier, but it, it's that respect that if we had everything in place at an early age, how much more could we also prevent and still obviously bring in the supports for psychologists. Now, Mike, and to the Green Party, I don't want to overstep because I, I don't want to invent something that we're going to promote, but in terms of the hard numbers as to how many psychologists per school per board there would be i think that that warrants further discussion um yeah thanks thanks so much matt uh, next i'm going to ask elaine to talk about uh this in in the context of uh the work that your organization does and how we resource uh let's say mental health uh supports um so specific to the child care unit, as I mentioned, we have special needs resourcing available. Uh, Wood Green as an organization does all kinds of work in um, supporting and we have mental health counseling, we have, and all of these things have now been moved online. The organization does a lot of work in this space. Um, and we also do a lot of work on issues of um, diversity and inclusion and equity um, to ensure to the best that we can that people are engaged and are not being left behind and are supported with whatever, the, whatever those supports are. Um, you know, we, we, uh, our, our vision is uh, a community where everyone has, is able to thrive and, and we do that by trying to, to uh, put all different kinds of supports in place, including the mental health ones. And we have a program, we have a pro another program, sorry, outside of uh, my unit, there's also another program uh, that's called Parents, it's called the POP program, and it's for parent, where parents or children with special needs support one another. Um, so there's supports available in a number of different uh, areas of our work. Thanks so much, Elaine. Uh, Mike, uh, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I was thinking of adding this in my wrap up. So keep going, Sean, because what I want to say relation okay. in relation to this, I'll do it in my rally. That sounds great. And, and we're getting close. Um, we're going to take one final question, and that's from Brown. And they ask uh, or state, research shows that reading levels at grade three is the best predictor for high school graduation. Currently in Ontario, we use a wait to fail model in determining who gets interventions. Do you have any ideas on how to change our model to a prevention strategy to better support students? Um, I, I, I do try to change up the order, but I really feel like Matt was probably the best person to start with, and then we'll go to Lane, and then we'll wrap up with Mike. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, thank you, Brown. And step one, remove permanently EQAO standardized testing. Obviously, stat testing still has to be part of it, but that does nothing for confidence at the grade three level because, Brown, as you've said, it's already being established and how do we prevent well that that actually goes back to what we've been hearing from from many um, many boards and many people in special education that there has to be the funding in place so that we can identify in that kindergarten jk and maybe even in child care as well if, if we can embed the models where we can establish and and prevent what some of those learning difficulties might be, if it turned out, it could be a central auditory processing issue. And then the funding can be put in place so that um, it, they're like different ear, different hearing sensors to, to literally alleviate what could be a, a, that learning difficulty. I can't tell you how many times in my own practice of teaching that it wasn't until students came to grade six, seven, eight, and then they finally get this time to get tested. And they're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you're hearing everything at a different decibel or at different frequencies. You should have had this back in kindergarten. And then who knows what it could have been. And I, I just use that as a specific example, but yeah, absolutely. We should have all students being tested, not EQAO, but for the, the um, uh, again, I'll use central auditory processing as the issue um, at, for testing at the earliest age possible so that we can prevent some of those, um, th those challenges that they're going to foresee later. Thanks so much, Matt. I'm going to hand things over to Elaine. 
Well, as I said a few minutes ago, I mean, I think early identification is really um, a key to um, to being able to intervene and support in ways that will hopefully bring about change. We've, you know, over uh, over the years, I've seen so many children um, overcome and grow and learn from you know, just develop their skills along the way. And it takes it takes people with a trained eye to understand the developmental pieces um, to and to understand that every child is different and that um, children learn in different ways, children develop skills at different times and just being able to zero in and support them, whatever that may look like. Um, you know, Kindergarten at this point is not a mandatory piece of the education um, system. It's, I mean, I know most children do go, but it's not a mandatory piece. So, you know, they, I think that while, while it might be important to use that as one of the milestones, I think you can't lose sight of the fact that you're still, there has to be something in place that's really going to have eyes on uh, children throughout their, throughout their early and later education careers and to to be able to hone in and support them. Thanks so much. Mike, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, when I said earlier, I would, I would think about this in wrapping up is, you know, in some respects, I think we as a society have to ask ourselves what our priorities are and is care and learning for children a priority? And I would say yes. And then I would say we have to make the investments to make it a priority. You know, Elaine talked about the importance of um, child care workers being adequately compensated, um, the importance of having enough staff, uh, the importance of making sure we have mental health supports for children who need it. You know, the wait time for mental, accessing mental health services right now for youth is about 18 months. Um, you know, imagine that. Imagine being a young person needing to access mental health supports and having to wait that long. And, you know, money doesn't solve everything because you have to spend money wisely and you have to spend money appropriately and you need to evaluate what the best programs are, et cetera. But the reality is, from my perspective, we've underinvested in childcare, we've underinvested in mental health and addiction supports, and we've underinvested in education. And so a lot of it really comes down to, you know, as a society, what do we value and what do we prioritize? And are we going to collectively make the investment to improve childcare and education for our children? Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone who shared uh, questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to them all. We had some more from online as well, uh, just in case. But we certainly didn't need them. It is five minutes after eight, so we really appreciate your patience. And I'm going to hand things over to Mike uh, to close out our town hall. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for uh, moderating. And thank you both, Elaine and Matt, for your expertise and insight. I learned a lot tonight. I want to thank the GPO team who's helped put tonight's event on and manage technology and everything else. And I especially want to help everyone who have participated. Your voices, your ideas, your questions. I've been trying to follow the comments as best as possible and chat without um, being distracted is all incredibly, incredibly valuable. And so if you'll give me a moment to be a bit political for a second, is I just want to say that as we develop our platform for the next election, we need your input, we need your insights, and I highly encourage each and every one of you to participate by, by sharing those with us in these events and outside of these events. And I'd also really like to just um, highlight and encourage people to consider being a candidate. Uh, we're looking for people who are passionate about politics that puts people before politics. And I'm especially proud of the Take the Lead campaign we've launched, which is proactively uh, recruiting uh, women and people of color to be candidates. 
and people from a variety of equity deserving groups. And I'm, I'm really proud of the, te- the work that our team is doing in proactively recruiting. And so I've been told that you have to ask women in particular seven times before they say yes. So all the women who are participating tonight, I'll ask this the first time and we'll keep asking. But I also want you to know that I'm, we've set up a, um, a fundraising campaign for equity deserving candidates. Uh, because I also know that if you're going to encourage people to run, you need to provide them with the financial support to run as well. And so, um, and, if, and if anyone wants to contribute to that campaign, you're certainly more than welcome to. Um, and so I just want to close by saying that um, I learned a lot tonight. Uh, I find these conversations very uh, inspiring and energizing. And I really believe that if we work together and we continue um, being politically engaged and making our voices heard, I'm a big believer in uh, people power change that um, we can deliver a greener and more caring Ontario and especially an Ontario that prioritizes caring for our children more than we do right now. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. Stay safe, be safe, take care of yourselves. Uh, and I hope you have an opportunity to get outside and enjoy the beautiful weather. Thanks, uh, thanks Tonight, so much, Mike. Well. There's some great links in the chat uh, before you go. Uh, you can uh, take a survey if, if you weren't able to ask your question uh, tonight. And this exercise, this time together we've had tonight has been all about uh, listening to uh, the people of Ontario and as we try to imagine uh, what it could be uh, from and how, we, how we're going to get there from here. So we'd really like you to participate that uh, in that survey if you have some time. Also, uh, if you want to become a candidate, we have the Take the Lead program, gpo.ca slash take the lead. And I just want to really uh, thank Rebecca for her fantastic comments and her challenge uh, to the Green Party to get more uh, women involved uh, in politics uh, and, and tying that very beautifully with tonight's conversation with how daycare is a, a part of that. Uh, but businesses need to encourage family involvement and not penalize parents who choose to care for their children in a balanced way and that's so true and politics is definitely part of that and when I was Mike's campaign manager uh, it was not often used because it was uh, a really um, uh, uncommon thing and I think it still is but we frequently arrange child care on site for the people coming out to canvas uh, for uh, parents uh, who otherwise wouldn't be able to participate in local democracy and that was uh, really important to us. So I want to say thank you uh, to Rebecca for that. Thank you to everyone, especially our panelists. Uh, a special thank you to Joe Kreiderman for speaking up when she couldn't raise her hand. That was so wonderful that you felt comfortable to do that. Uh, I want to let you know that we have more town halls coming up. We really hope uh, to see you there. Uh, thank you so much for everything tonight. Uh, and please uh, have a chance to uh, share your ideas with the Green Party of Ontario as we put together our platform for the next election that's going to be less than one year away. Take care, everyone. Have a great night.